you are about to hear a second-rate sermon. I know that doesn't sound so great, but stay tuned to find out what I mean. Welcome to Reach Out and Live, a program of music, scripture, and sermon, brought to you each week by the many viewers and members of First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi, my name's Jim, minister here at First Plymouth. Now today we're in Philippians 4. I'm so glad you've joined us. Let's worship together. Our scripture this morning comes from Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, 
Let your request be known to God. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there are any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Let us come together in a time of prayer. Lord, many times your word becomes our prayer. It instructs us, it guides us back to center when we have let worries overtake our emotions. Forgive us when we focus too much on the pandemic or the plagues of this world, politics, or what is going wrong in our life. Lord, help us to transform our thinking and our way of living as your word instructs us. May we wake up with a spirit of rejoice instead of a spirit of regret. Lord, may we commit to thinking about all the blessings you have given each of us, all the beauty that is around us. For in reality, thank you, Lord, that we are safe, we are free, we are fed, and we are loved by you, O oh God. In a world of stress, let us become the gentleness that others need. In a world of chaos, let us be the calm in the storm. And may we seek your peace in all of our prayers. All this we ask in your holy name to transform us. Amen. There are obviously bad forms of religion, such as violent fundamentalism, doomsday cults, money-grubbing tele-evangelists, and plain charlatry. But in this new three-part series, I will be exploring the more subtle ways that religion can devolve into the silly and banal. So let's discern together what makes for a religion of deep goodness. I'm in my sermon series on bad religion the way religion can sort of go sideways and lose sense of its true mission and purpose to increase love. That's what religion is about, to increase the love between people, the love of life, the love of God. But religions can lose that sense. I'm not preaching in this series about terrible religion because I already hope and pray that terrible religion is obvious to you when you see it, like when the Taliban won't educate women, or, or when there's white supremacist Christianity that is almost like the KKK again, or machine gun toting Buddhists. I know it's hard to believe there are machine gun toting Buddhists, but there are, because violence can infect religion everywhere, and I trust you know that that is terrible. And I'm not preaching about the terrible forms of religion that somehow rob human beings of their intrinsic dignity, their personhood, like religions that rob them of a sense of dignity if you're gay or you're a transgender person. I'm not talking about terrible forms of religion that hold human beings down, and there are those types. And I'm not even preaching about when religion has bad theology. There's lots of bad theology. When religions try to indoctrinate human beings with beliefs rather than awaken spiritual curiosity. I'm not preaching about the bad theology of fundamentalism when it takes certain verses in the Bible literally and then others it doesn't. Like when it takes verses in Genesis literally about the creation of the earth and then thinks it has to be opposed to the theory of evolution or science, or when it takes certain verses literally to hold persons down, but then it won't take this verse literally. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. 
I'm still waiting for a biblical literalist to take that sentence completely literally. But I'm not trying to preach in this sermon series about just bad theology. And I'm not even trying to preach about what I would call the second-rate aspects to religion. There's a lot of second-rate aspects. I mean, take worship. There are some 370,000 churches in America, and there's a lot of second-rate worship. I mean, take preaching. Every weekend, then, there's at least 350,000 sermons given, and most of those would be second-rate. I feel like I might be in a second-rate sermon right at this moment. You can't always preach a good sermon. There's so many sermons being given. Most will be second-rate by definition. And you know what? I grew up listening to a lot of second-rate preaching. I grew up in churches where the sermons were really boring. And you know what? It was kind of calming and peaceful. It actually still made church very endearing to me. I would sort of zone out during the sermons, think about other things. And you could always tell there was a good intention. See, here's the thing, too. A lot of the ministers I most loved growing up, they weren't great preachers but they cared about you and about church and life. You can't be good at everything. Maybe they weren't great preachers, but they were a wonderful minister. Or what about church music? There's a lot of second-rate church music. I could probably preach a 20-part series on bad church music. I've grown up in churches with bad church music. Like when the organ sounds like you're in a funeral home all the time, or a horror movie, or but bad church music, if it's honest and authentic, well, then it's just lovely, even if it's second rate. I think it's even better than when you walk into a mega church and they've got a tight band. I mean, there are some killer bands in Christian worship these days. I mean, you can walk into a church and, and hear this band just rocking, and the pop singers can do all these perfect ornamentations with their voice, and the music is right on but the theology in the music seems kind of off. And at times, the whole thing doesn't come off as authentic to me. So I'm not talking about second-rate church music either. And I'm not even talking about the second-rate affectations that can affect religion. Religion can kind of have these styles, and it becomes so contrived-looking to me. Like, take my title, The Reverend. That's always struck me as a ridiculous title to have. The revered one? Are you kidding me? But these affectations and stylizations of religion, it can all be sort of second rate. Or take all these distinctions we make between Methodist, Presbyterian, or Congregational, or UCC. Really, all that stuff's Pepsi or Coke. It's like exactly the same thing, but we act like these minute distinctions are so essential theologically. It's kind of potato or potato. I'm not talking about the affectations of religion. No, I'm talking about when religion becomes bad by promoting something that's good that really isn't that good. Last week I was talking about smugness, how religion can just be smug and always promote itself as something wonderful and amazing and hype itself, and how religion doesn't need to hype itself so much. Just be a gentle, wonderful thing, and people will be drawn to it. This week, I want to talk about how religion becomes bad when it touts itself as liberal, and how religion becomes bad when it touts itself as conservative. Okay, hold on. I'm going to need to explain this carefully because I bet almost everyone listening right now imagines themselves as either being liberal or conservative. Those two words almost mesmerize us now with power. It's like our whole identity. We embed our personhood in these terms. I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative. It's all totally overplayed, but this is what we do now. And those distinctions are fraught with anxiety. Are you a liberal or are you a conservative? So what do I mean that religion is bad when it touts itself as liberal or touts itself as conservative? I do need to explain first, I'm not talking 
about political parties. When I say those words, liberal or conservative, immediately your mind jumps to the Democratic Party and the GOP right away. But I'm not talking about political parties. I'm talking about liberal religion and conservative religion. And in religion, liberal and conservative, those words carry a set of ideas. And I'm going to argue it's bad when religion reduces itself to one set of ideas, when it's just promoting itself as liberal or just promoting itself as conservative. You've actually reduced the good. There's two sets of wonderful ideas here philosophically. For example, liberal religion, that basically refers to a religion that's trying to reconceive its traditional theological beliefs based on modern knowledge and science which that's a good thing to always look at your beliefs based on the best of modern philosophy and ethics and science. And liberal religion tends to be a little wary of authority and believes that an authentic form of Christianity doesn't have to be based on authority like a pope or even the Bible that in your own heart you could know Jesus Christ. So liberal religion focuses on individual reason and experience. Liberal religion tends to think that Religion is more an ethical way of life than a set of beliefs. Well, those are wonderful ideas. Conservative religion, th that tends to really honor custom and tradition. You see, conservative religion believes that human society has built up important social capital and relationships and institutions over time and you shouldn't willy-nilly change those. You should really honor tradition and custom and even authority. That authority and institutions have been developed through time to help lead us in salutary directions and you don't want to blow all that up and question all of authority and conservative religion tends to be more prudent not wanting to make decisions too quickly. These are all good ideas in religion. So I think it's bad when you limit your set of good ideas and call yourself just a liberal Christian or a conservative Christian. I know I'm treading on thin ice. Those words mean a lot to you, I'm sure. They form your identity. But why limit a good set of ideas? I think religion itself transcends those distinctions between liberal and conservative. What we want is a wise and authentic religion. At any moment, you have to select from those sets of liberal and conservative ideas in the creation of good religion. But bad religion? Well, it virtually does become the Democratic Party at prayer or the Republican Party at prayer just when it begins to fashion that conservatism or liberalism is, is an identifier. I don't want to be a liberal Christian or a conservative Christian. I want to be Christian. I want to be seeking out the good and the noble and the true, and at any moment I might need to deploy ideas from both conservative philosophical tradition and liberal tradition to seek the good. I don't want to be a liberal or conservative Christian. I want to be a Christian seeking to follow Christ. Now, if you could prove to me that Christ was a liberal or Christ was a conservative, if you could prove to me that Christ was a Democrat or a Republican, then I might be more concerned about that identifier. <laughs> but I don't think you can. I want to follow in the footsteps of Christ, deploying all the good and best ideas. I can't tell talking through a camera whether I've irritated you now these last moments. I can't tell, but I, I don't mean to irritate. I mean to draw us to something higher beyond these binary categories that we begin to base our life upon. We're seeking what is noble and true. Listen to Philippians. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, then think about those things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. My friends, bad religion 
will take on these categories of culture and define itself and limit the good. Good religion will seek out all that is noble and true and move forward in the footsteps of Christ. Together, let's walk with him. Go forth this day, not seeking to be a liberal or conservative, but seeking what is good and true and noble and seeking to walk in His way. May you go in peace.
It's wonderful that we could worship together. Do you know you could join our worship services live every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 10.30 on YouTube, Facebook, and our website. And all of that is made possible by friends like you and the members here at First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. If you believe that an open-minded, loving congregation can help change the world, then consider making a donation. It will help us increase the love of God and neighbor, both in Nebraska and the world. If you would like to learn more about our church, go to firstplymouth.org. You can watch videos of the sermons, learn about our many programs and missions, then follow us to Facebook and become a friend. We now worship online at 9 a.m. and 10.30 on YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, and our website. We also add live events, so join us online. The sole purpose of the human being is to develop their most noble traits. Whether those traits tend towards the liberal or conservative is not what matters. What matters is what is true and honest and just. And when you develop that nobility, we can all reach out and live. Tune in again next week for another edition of Reach Out and Live.